in our series this year that we have relaunched and very pleased to um, be welcoming you and we have set the recording just because lots of people have asked for recordings and if that's okay with everybody we will we have now a youtube channel so we will uh, make it available hope that's good with everybody um in terms of just a bit of housekeeping if you're more familiar with zoom or teams although i think most of your work that now the access panel is in the bottom right corner we encourage you to Contribute in the chat if you've got any questions, but have indicate with a, a queue. Uh, also, at the end, when uh, we will launch into a Q&A session, you can use your raise hand and also unmute your mic and, and pose any questions for that. If you notifications bother you, you can use the um, um, settings on the bottom right corner. But that's really it. Uh, hopefully, um, um, yeah, that will be OK. And I think it, this is really my cue to welcome Professor Armelini, Virginia Te Tahira Antunes, and Rob Howe, who will talk about the student voice on active blended learning. So over to you, three of you. We look forward to hearing from you. That's great. Thank you very much, Tundi. Thank you for uh, introducing us. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rob Howe, Head of Learning Technology. And uh, as um, Tunde actually said, we've also got Virginia and Ali uh, on the call as well. We're going to be talking about uh, some research that we've, we've actually done at uh, Northampton. Um, in terms of the, the chat, it will keep people muted for now. And then later on, uh, there's a chance to actually ask questions. OK. Um, so first thing, just a little bit of institutional context just around uh, Northampton, uh, University of Northampton. So um, back in 1261, original University of Northampton, four years later, that was dissolved. Um, then we became a technical college, then became NEN College. We got university college status, full university status 2005. Um, and we've got around about 12,000 students, 1,500 staff across three different faculties. In 2014, we had a move to active blended learning uh, as a new pedagogy, and it's actually taken quite a few years for that to actually um, settle into, uh, into the institution itself. But around active blended learning, we actually developed a new campus. So this is our Waterside campus, um, and you're welcome to look at it online, and then obviously, um, a little bit later on, you can visit us later in the in the year. Um, brand new campus, so 330 million pounds spent actually in terms of developing it, and we've now been a few years in, uh, and we've been rolling out active blended learning as part of one of the cores really um, of um, being actually at Waterside itself. So in terms of changes that were actually going on at the time, um, quite a few different dimensions actually going on there. Uh, we were looking, this is around about that sort of 2014, 2015 time period. We were looking at those three core elements particularly. We're looking at grab, graduate attributes. We were looking at the assessment review and we were looking at active blended learning. So the, the graduate attributes, we were looking at ethically driven uh, graduates. For the assessment review, we were looking at our outcomes consistent, really, with uh, being in a 21st century. And actually, blended learning, which is really what the focus is today, it's focused very much on this, this scalable learning and teaching. Um, and we'll say a little bit more, really, about what active blended learning is. We had an institutional definition, and you can see the definition um, obviously on the screen at the moment um, and there's some key parts actually inside that so we've got sense making activities you've got focused student interactions uh, with all of the sort of the key agents that are actually as part of that process and includes both in and outside the classroom um, as well in terms of what ABL actually means um, we've got a few you know four bullet points really about what the key thing is so we've got um, particularly we've got activities, so students learning through these activities, we've got subject knowledge and applying that actually for their professional skills. Plenty of feedback, um, digital fluency and really some flexibility as well in relation to, to time and place more generally. In terms of what it actually means for a course, so um, a course sort of follows that if it follows those those three sort of core sort of principles um, and we've got those on our um, Institute of Learning and Teaching website actually uh, at Northampton. 
In terms of just building that up then, um, there's a number of key elements that actually go towards um, a session that is actually running with, with ABL. So you have the pre-session sense-making activities. Um, you've got the embedded content and resources there. You've also got real-time sessions, particularly webinars at the moment, but obviously it could be face-to-face -face sessions. And through those, you've got a whole mix of different uh, question and answer sessions. You've got discussion sessions and various analysis that actually goes into that generally. And then after the session itself, you have uh, consolidation. You, you reflect uh, on the event itself. So if we put that in a sort of a broader context, all of that is the, the three sort of green circles really, or the, the scaffolding uh, for what we're actually talking about. The, the two at the sort of the, the 12 o'clock and the, the seven o'clock position, those are tend to be tutor moderated. Um, and most of that is uh, asynchronous actually in terms of uh, the way it's actually delivered. Um, the one on the, the right hand side, sort of the five o'clock position, that is more about being tutor facilitated um, and it's more about synchronous um, and it's not about delivery uh, at all. It's about the interaction actually um, with the students at the time. So for Northampton, um, active blended learning obviously was a really core change actually um, in, in the way that we were doing um, some of our learning and teaching and it built on the, the strengths I think that a lot of our academics were already doing um, at that time. As you'd expect with such a, a major pedagogical change, evaluation uh, was very much important uh, as part of that process. So what I'm going to do now is to pass on to, to Virginia to go through um, some of the, the questions particularly that we wanted to focus on um, and what we want to focus on really as part of today. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so as part of this evaluation process that we've done for several changes that the university went through, uh, we've conducted a study uh, on the students um, and we were kind of focusing on two main uh, questions, which was their perceptions of uh, the, their own experiences within ABL and what kind of enablers and barriers could they find to have quality and successful uh, learning experiences. So that guided our study and um, this study was a two-stage uh, study. Uh, at the start we focused on the tutors um, and we did a wide range uh, survey and then we narrowed it down to um, some tutors that were willing to have in-depth interviews with us and from those we asked to have access to some of their students. The idea was to have a bit of a background of what the tutors were uh, actually doing in terms of their practice uh, so we could understand students' um, res uh, responses a little bit better. So we uh, conducted con focus groups with uh, 60 students uh, and we focused on things like effective practice, what for them was effective practice, uh, how they felt their pre-session tasks were or not uh, linked to their face-to-face -face, um, activities, and what they considered to be uh, engaging learning uh, experiences. So then we did uh, in vivo analysis, so it was a qualitative study, uh, and in the in vivo analysis we had around 26, uh, yeah, 26 teams, and we narrowed them down, down to the ones that we considered to be more saturated, so the ones that appeared at least in four different focus groups uh, in a, um, a number of times, a significant number of times. Um, we then grouped this into three categories, um, learning experiences, social experiences, and learning support. Um, which I'm going to go through more in depth. So this one was quite a long one because obviously that's that was pretty much the focus was the learning experiences. Um, so we talked about uh, with learners about ser several things and we realized that they really value um, how their activities link theory and practice in the sense that it will give them um, better skills for employability. They said pretty much the same in terms of assessment. Um, so that was a very key um, component for them was that uh, they felt prepared uh, for employability. Um, in terms of what they felt were engaging learning experiences, while they talked a lot about being active and being engaged in activities uh, within the face-to-face -face synchronous classes and all that and asynchronous, they also uh, 
related what they consider to be engaging a lot with what tutors were like in terms of their personal traits and personal characteristics. So those tutors that were um, nicer to them and more uh, engaging, more social, uh, would make them feel more engaged in sessions. This obviously means that there was a lot of variability in how their experiences were um, in terms of different tutors. So from one session to another, from one tutor to another, they would have different um, experiences and they were very aware of that. Um, they uh, noted uh, strongly that the use of technology was one of the areas that uh, could be uh, seen th this variability because some tutors were using it um, in a creative way, interactive, trying to promote their engagement, while others were using very limited, namely true, um, just the use of PowerPoints. Um, and, and this use of PowerPoints is interesting because um, for them, those engaging learning experiences needed to be uh, more than just um, being there and listening to someone read through a PowerPoint, and they were very clear about that. In terms of uh, their pre-session tasks and how they linked with uh, the face-to-face -face sessions, they felt like they were great to uh, promote uh, for, for them to be able to engage better in face-to-face -face sessions, but they really valued tutors that knew um, how to engage every learner, every student, even those that hadn't done um, the pre-session tasks. Um, so that was quite uh, significant for them, and the main reason for them to attend was to feel comfortable, to feel that they would be engaged whether they had done the pre-session tasks or not, and uh, that they would be doing something in the, in the uh, synchronous session that would be more than just reading through uh, PowerPoints. So that was pretty much the core of this category. Um, and then the second category, which is social experiences, was quite, quite important for them. Um, they uh, started by uh, discussing a lot of the communication within the sessions and how they valued tutors that, um, that were open to questioning and that engaged them in discussions in the sessions and all that, but they went further than that. Uh, they said they, they particularly valued, valued those uh, tutors that would talk to them about other stuff, uh, about their personal problems, uh, that were open to help them with even other subject areas or um, give them um, any range of, of, of support and communication uh, and, and responded to emails, all of that. So um, they, they talked a lot about tutors that were seen as uh, going the extra mile for them. That was an expression that they used a lot. Uh, tutors that seemed to care uh, and that made them feel more like partners in that uh, learning and teaching experience. Um, so it was very important for them that um, they were engaged in the, in the activities and that tutors made them feel not as uh, be, beneath them, but at the same level and part of the whole process. This is also seen a little bit on the third category, uh, learning support where it was very clear that learners, uh, students were expecting not only classroom-based support, the, um, the help with uh, all of the like exam skills, all of that, but also they expected tutors to be available for them for further than that. They, they valued stu um, tutors that would meet them in the, in the corridor and just say, how are you? Why do you have that face? And um, stuff like that. So um, those were the tutors that they would engage more with. Um, and that was very clear in this research because those were the learner, the, the students that kept, uh, uh, that gave me more of their time, that made sure they were talking uh, as as much as they possibly could. And instead of having 10 minutes uh, focus group, we had half an hour, for example, because they said, well, my tutor is amazing. Why wouldn't I do this for her? Uh, which was quite interesting. Also, the issue of employability comes back here uh, because that support that goes beyond the classroom is also on uh, valued for tutors that, for example, give them um, information about in terms that they can apply to conferences that so extra things that they don't necessarily need to do, but that will uh, help the students uh, be more prepared in terms of employability. Yeah. So. The key for this study was that we wanted to try to 
contribute in some way to this question of, of the student engagement. We know that in the sector, this has been um, a long uh, issue, a long-lasting issue. Uh, so this study tried to really contribute to it, and there are some ideas, uh, some some data that we can redraw from here that will kind of help in this. Uh, mainly, the idea of social uh, interactions and the sense of belonging and how important it is, um, and how important it is to foster that sense of engagement and belonging to the um, to the institution in general. So. In, in summary, basically, uh, what matters to learners is, to students, uh, is learning experiences beyond the classroom. Uh, they don't only want to be in that conscripted restricted space anymore. They want to learn uh, more than that, and blended uh, helps that um, to happen a lot. Uh, tasks and assignments that link theory and practice so that they feel more uh, employable. That's the main concern, as we know, with uh, students nowadays. And the idea that because we now have blended uh, the idea of going to a face-to-face -face session where you do just the reading of the PowerPoints is no longer enough. And for them to go to that effort, the, those sessions need to have that added value of engaging them, of giving them something that goes beyond um, just um, listening to, to a tutor um, read. So um, they very much, highlighted the idea of how important the social interaction and communication were both in, in terms of synchronous and asynchronous um, interactions and that idea of tutors that go the extra mile particularly always connecting that with uh, tutors personal traits like accessibility and sociability etc so what we have in this study is basically that Tutors and students can and should be seen as partners that will engage uh, students a lot more. Uh, and digital technology and blended learning can work as a tool to blur those boundaries between the asynchronous and the synchronous, the um, learning spaces, the classroom and outside, beyond the classroom, and promote interaction um, both within and beyond the classroom. So um, it's all about uh, easing that's what digital technology works for in in the students uh, minds is to kind of help make all of this um holistic uh experience of experience as um a whole so we kind of conclude something that isn't art chattering but still uh, is a significant that both the academic and the pastoral support and and the relationships all of those are needed to provide these holistic uh, learning and teaching experiences because just having quality learning experience is not enough anymore. Learn, uh, students expect more. By doing that uh, we can uh, by giving them this holistic, uh, rich learning and teaching experience, we will work on their engagement, we'll um, increase and enhance interaction, we enhance their feeling of belonging, and then we work on those metrics that um, a higher education uh, is so concerned with, like retention, satisfaction, etc. So they, they are really important um, as a, a uh, an idea to take from there. Finally, this is basically the summary of everything that we've been saying so far. Um, all of the little uh, enablers of positive learning experiences, these holistic learning experiences that go from the, the theory practice link to um, uh, having those partnerships and having support that goes beyond the classroom, all of that is really, really important. Now, one kind of unexpected value or impact of this study was that it uh, informed the institution into how to deal with something that was also very unexpected, which was the pandemic and the impact it had on provision. So a lot of what we've done and, and a lot of this ABL um, issue is going, helped this institution and hopefully others into uh, how to deal with the pandemic. Um, and Ali will now uh, kind of uh, discuss this topic a little bit and offer some reflections. Ali, up to you. Yes, will do. Um, um, hello, everyone, and um, uh, thanks, Virginia, for that. Um, I, I think I, I'd like to use the last few minutes of this session to reflect on some of the things that, that Virginia and Rob uh, 
elaborated on earlier and then move on, move us on to the to this transition period where <clears throat> some some things um, might actually shape the future of the sector and the future of our institutions far uh, beyond the the pandemic first however um, I, I think there is a, a, a need to stress the, uh, the, the, the what Virginia said about activity development, activity creation. Uh, a lot of the time uh, we see colleagues um, thinking that they are setting learning activities in preparation for next week's sessions or as part of next week session or, or, or in any context. And they say, well, read this, watch that, come back with three key points. And, uh, and I think while there is a place for that, really we need to do better than that. We need to think about our activity design in much more serious terms. We have to be much more creative. We have to push students in a way that the standard thing, read this, watch that, come back with three points, does not achieve. Uh, we need to add value. We know from data, from this study and others, that in order for a typical blended learning student to, to, to attend sessions, you've got to, you've got to add value. They, they will attend sessions that do that, regardless of whether they are recorded or not. If you add value in the classroom or in the lab or in the field or in the studio, <clears throat> uh, the students will be there because they see that, they, that those sessions move them on. This notion of partnerships uh, that Virginia and Rob uh, uh, spoke about, uh, they do not necessarily refer to formal things. They refer to also to informal uh, partnerships. They, 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 they refer to, um, uh, to links between groups of students and group of, groups of staff uh, that could be as simple as doing a, 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 a mini formative task together over a period of a week or two weeks or whatever it is. <clears throat> the students value these partnerships and I think many of my colleagues value these partnerships too. And, um, and uh, one final point before moving on to the transition is uh, this: the, what, what Virginia referred to as the big issue, the, the student engagement issue. And I would put it to you that uh, a lot of the problems around uh, student engagement revolve around staff engagement and uh, and it's it's not comfortable reading to many but but it is uh, it it I would suggest that um, staff engagement visibility and the level of activity correlates with the engagement visibility and level of activity of the student um, in order to get them engaged, we've got to be visible. We've got to be seen to be engaging ourselves. It's not a case of uploading the task, uploading the material and hoping for the best. We've got to be there all of the time and we've got to be there <clears throat> for them, with them, uh, alongside them. So as the 20th of March uh, 2020 hit, um, we had a situation across the sector. We had uh, issues uh, to do with um, what are we going to do next week when we uh, when we need to continue our courses, uh, but we can no longer use the campus. And uh, what this study would point to, and others that 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 were run alongside this one. Um, <clears throat> They, they point to an issue of pedagogic knowledge and understanding. Not so much about technology, not in the case of Northampton, uh, but, in, but, but, but certainly uh, uh, questions and answers of a pedagogic nature. So uh, the work done on active blended learning since 2014 at the University of Northampton put the university in a fairly favorable position to face the challenges of the last 12 months the level of <clears throat> the level of pedagogic understanding had increased as had the level of digital fluency across 
members of staff and across the student body. Over the previous couple of years, we had started a, a, a laptop scheme. Uh, students, first year students, were getting a, a laptop as part of their a registration. Uh, staff all got mobile devices. All of that, with a huge amount of training and development, helped to improve all of those uh, metrics to put us in a good position. But I insist the primary element was pedagogic knowledge and understanding. We need to think about a scenario uh, from March 2020 of lower proximity and synchronicity, and I'll go into that uh, in a moment on the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> the engagement and visibility of the tutor, as I said before, critical to generate engagement and visibility from the student. <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, key issues of autonomy with no campus to be used, um, no people to that we were allowed to, to visit, and uh, the, um, the constant need to explore ways in which we can advance our digital fluency. So if we look at that diagram, we have a, uh, on the, on the x-axis, we've got high proximity, low proximity. So high proximity is very much um, uh, high face-to-face -face contact, if you like. Low proximity is, is low geographical uh, uh, proximity. On the y-axis, uh, you've got synchronicity. So high synchronicity is real-timeness. Low is asynchronous. Uh, and um, bottom left quadrant would refer to our standard bread and butter activity for most, for all campus-based universities. So that's our traditional campus offering. Top right is the traditional, uh, mostly asynchronous, asynchronous provision uh, by, uh, at a distance. The, the interesting bits is, uh, are, are the other two, perhaps, and, and how we shifted from one uh, section of this diagram to the other. Top left, top left, very important group of students, those who are campus-based, Mm. But because of COVID, have been working mostly asynchronously. So trying to access uh, the webinars, the seminars, the, the, the lectures from the halls of residence or from home. And bottom right is real-time provision uh, for geographically dispersed students. So, so things like uh, Teams sessions, Zoom sessions or uh, Blackboard Collab sessions like today. And then I'd like you to think about how our model shifted uh, from March last year. Uh, so I would put it to you that uh, we moved, apologies for the quality of the slides, not great uh, when it converted to collab, but the, we moved from, for campus-based institutions like, like mine, uh, we, we moved from the bottom left as our primary area uh, with bits of the other, areas with bits of the other quadrants but our main area bottom left we move from there to there and and we have to understand what that what that shift means mm? so we've got we've got to shift from a traditional campus-based provision to something else and each institution had to figure out what that something that something else looked like <clears throat> it wasn't always straightforward it wasn't easy uh, and um, and we had lots of issues to address uh, in relation to how our provision had to shift the the staff development that was required, uh, and we had to do that pretty much overnight. So we we moved to uh, a scenario where we had to cater for students who were based largely on campus, but were accessing sessions asynchronously, and students who went home mm, completely. And, uh, and became de facto uh, distance learners while they were part of a cohort that we did not want to lose the, the key elements from. So that is a, a central part of what happened uh, as uh, ABL uh, developed into ADL or active distance learning, if you like. Um, As I said, years of experience with active blended learning mm, turned out to be quite instrumental for this transition. Mm. Uh, what we did 
is we we put in place a range of staff development sessions from March 2020. The by far the best attended staff development session uh, at that point, March, April, May 2020, was one called lesson planning. And um, in that session, very short online session, about 45 minutes, we went through the key, the basic elements that constitute a good lesson plan, a lesson plan for online teaching, synchronous and asynchronous, and critically, the blend of the two. Um, we were in a good position because Northampton provides a, what we would call a future-focused, risk-friendly, digitally rich environment. For the reasons I outlined before, we were, <clears throat> we were in, in a good place to push the agenda forward and to fill in gaps where we knew uh, staff or students needed additional support. The case of uh, the case of lesson planning was a very uh, was, a, was a was a typical example of a session that uh, people really needed. And that, well, I, please help me plan uh, a session, whether that is in real time, whether that is over a week asynchronous, or whether there's a combination of both. And all of the above required a generous, very generous dose of patience uh, on all parts. And finally, a couple of references for you to consider if, you, if you'd like to do a bit of reading on that and the studies and, 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 and some of the other key conclusions that we did not cover today. Um, uh, the, those are on the screen now. So I will uh, pause here and I will hand back to Tunde uh, to uh, take us to the next uh, stage. Yeah, thanks all, all three of you. That was excellent. The chat has been buzzing all, all along. So I think at this point, what I would like to do is just if people have questions to ask, uh, can you please raise your hand? If you wanted to ask the question uh, aloud that you put in the chat, please do so. And I can also pick some questions out from the chat. But if you indicate with putting hands up that you have a question, then you can have the mic and ask your question aloud. And while we're waiting for someone to do that, uh, I could perhaps relay some of the, so there was a really interesting discussion in the chat around um, the, this idea that um, is, is what you later then uh, you elaborated on, Ail, is, is the um, link between staff and student engagement and you know staff engagement uh, and visibility then promote student engagement. And there were a lot of questions around you know, how you might, I think Jeffrey, Andrew, Vicky were asking around how have you enabled staff to uptake the approach, the ABL? How, how do you upscale them um, to be able to implement it effectively was a specific question from Andrew, but there's a, a associated questions from Je Jeffrey and Vicky as well. So I don't know which one of you want to take that perhaps. Well, I can start and then I'll move on to Rob because Rob knows the, the details. Um, but um, one of the things that we've seen in the um, in the part of the study, the stage one where we talked to staff, was about giving them opportunities to share uh, their knowledge, to uh, kind of share experiences and training, obviously, and support all the time. Um, also trying to uh, use the strengths of the staff that we already had and, and the strengths that they already had and try to build up on it by giving them those opportunities um, and giving them time to to uh, to use those. But Rob probably can tell you a little bit more about all of the training and, um, well, not training, sorry, um, all of the, the support that was uh, provided by the university. Yeah, there's a wide range of support that was uh, sort of in place. Um, so we have um, sort of staff um, sort of aligned to, to all of the faculty. So there was always people uh, engaged uh, as necessary actually with that. We also um, embedded a lot of the, these ideas and principles. We embedded that in some of the curriculum design and redesign processes. So uh, we internally called that the Cairo um, development cycle. So um, this allowed us to actually embed it straight into the curriculum. 
Um, and we also had a range of events which allowed people to share really good experiences um, of where they were doing this already and they were able to then to share this with with other staff in a in a supported forum so they were giving good examples and we we're also picking up their uh, particularly case studies and, and tips that we were then using um, as part of further promotion uh, with staff because um, it's it's one of the things I think people expect these sort of messages to come out centrally um, but actually it's more powerful when actually the staff that are doing this already and have learned from experiences are actually um, telling other staff about how they have done it and contextualize that for their own subject areas uh, particularly as well. Ali did you want to say any more? Yeah on that? yeah I, I wanted to add a couple of things on that. Um, uh, one absolutely critical the <coughs> the Cairo or Carpe Diem um, learning design process was central to this that enabled us to to embed these principles right from the conception of the course and uh, and with the course as a team approach to course design that helped us put the seeds in and and get that development and that thinking uh, right from the start of the course and there is a question relate, that relates to that. How do we get from the lesson planning to the big picture? Well, if you, if you think lesson, week, month, term, year, program, the Carpe Diem or Kyra process allows us, enables us to, uh, to design with, for, all of those, for all of those things. The storyboarding element of the, of the process was central. Uh, and, and that was kind of the, the when the penny dropped that people, oh, I can actually do this in a rather different way from what I was doing before. It is not content driven. It is not getting the content I've got to cover <clears throat> uh, and slice it into 12 weeks and then deliver it. Uh, we kind of removed the word deliver from the narrative. Uh, we removed the word cover and we looked at other things, particularly learning outcomes, alignment of those to assessment and what good teaching looks like in between them the, 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 those two uh, and that that enabled us to, to 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 bring colleagues on board because we were showing value we were showing value of this it was not this was not in addition to their job uh, this was their job so this it, it, it very it very quickly over the years became clear if that can call, call quickly uh, it became clear that that was a good way of doing things. In the middle of that, of course, we had the, the figure, I don't know if you, you might remember that, Rob, of the learning and teaching coordinators uh, that uh, played a key role in promoting and scaling up this in the faculties. And, um, uh, and, and the argument at the time was, um, actually, learning and teaching is, is everyone's role, not the role of the learning and teaching coordinator. Uh, so after, after they had created a critical mass of 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 interest uh, of engagement of belief uh, they, uh, the, the, the the role of the learning and teaching coordinator kind of disappeared and uh, and it was felt that this was everyone's role not the role of one person so I hope I, I've covered some of the key elements that that enabled us to bring st staff with us in this process so can I sneak in two questions on the back of that thank thank you all the i think vicky asked a specific one because you're talking about critical mass and how you are expanding people who, who get get on board with this new approach or you know the active the abl approach and i think vicky was asking about he, interested in hearing how northampton addresses for example when staff do just read powerpoints or bend the abl approach to continue to teach in other ways and that was an perhaps um slightly different but but because just because you mentioned workload um andrew was also asking about any workload challenge for staff in developing the blend effectively so sorry to ask two questions at the same time and i'm just okay, keeping I, 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 your hand up as well while you're responding <laughs> I, I i would say <clears throat> i left northampton in september so probably rob is is better placed to tackle some of that as it is today <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> I first hand over to, to Rob and then and then uh, pick up on the on, on a, one or two things I want to say. Okay. 
Yeah, I think in terms of um, I think in terms of building up the the capacity, uh, particularly um, in terms of, of sharing that with with staff, and also I think that time scale thing that you mentioned as well, um, along with the the PowerPoint. So you can you can push out methodologies till you're blue in the face, but if some staff want to do things in a particular way, they will probably carry on doing some of those things. And actually, if you look at the second paper uh, that we actually put, um, which is very much about the, the staff experiences of, of moving to ABL, you will see, I think, some of the fact that staff are they fall into a number of different categories um, in terms of their their attitude to change generally and I mean I think those of you that are institutions at the moment can also reflect on the different staff that you actually work with and the fact that some of them will play a tokenistic um, uh, nod essentially to whatever you're trying to push out centrally and then just carry on doing whatever they they decide to do. Um, we have not done um, uh, as necessarily a hard audit essentially so we're not walking into everyone's classroom and saying you're doing a PowerPoint that's wrong or anything like that um, what we have to do to a certain extent is to trust that the academics are doing the right things for their situations at that particular time it might be that a short PowerPoint is actually appropriate for some part of a session and then they'll carry on and do something else at another time um, we're not going to get into the uh, the view that we've got to sit in every one session and to check that they're following some sort of ABL type methodology. At the end of the day, a lot of this is about good teaching. So we have to trust, um, I think, our tutors to to basically pick up the key things from this um, and actually to, to expand that into their own environment. The time aspect is obviously incredibly difficult. And I know, I think, you know, again, the time at the moment is is very challenging we've got a number of change processes and i think it was mentioned in the chat about change management uh, and certainly that is covered uh, a lot more in the in the other article as well um it, it is about exactly about change management uh, and it's about very good communication it's about bringing people with you um, it's about trying to give people the the headspace uh, and the time to actually do their jobs properly um, I'm not sure that we've managed to solve all of that at Northampton. I think that would be a, uh, a miracle if we've managed to actually do that. Um, and there are still things, very much competing pressures, I think, um, at the same time. So um, it is, you know, sometimes uh, some subject areas have given people um, protected time to try and do things. In other areas, that's been a lot more difficult to do, you know, and you know, we do certainly mm -hmm. emphasize with the, the tutors that challenge to, you find this a challenge to actually put these things into place. I mean, in the, in the chat, there was a discussion around uh, the showing staff or, or just to get them experience the joy of teaching online and, and how, you know, on, on the other hand, that, that was to some extent some of the strategies you know and, and LA, uh, you you talked about that if if they see that oh i could do it this way and this is actually i enjoy it that 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 can be a really positive way of getting people on board as well right. thank you, you, you. Know, I, I, i'd like to add one or two things Tunde. Uh, yeah. one, one in relation to your final point <clears throat> and <clears throat> i had so the uh, question number points or you mean oh, you no, mean I, this I, I wanted to I wanted to just um, stress or, or, or illustrate that point uh, because over uh, particularly at the earlier stages of the rollout of ABL, <clears throat> I had very a, a number of very difficult conversations with colleagues and um, and uh, I will ask the audience uh, colleagues uh, from around the world to tell me uh, which discipline they think uh, some of these colleagues came from. So uh, just 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 for a bit of fun, but. Um, uh, on one occasion, I remember uh, at the old cafeteria, the old campus, um, uh, I sit down with two colleagues from a particular discipline, uh, one, one fairly experienced, one very young. Uh, and the experienced guy uh, looks at me in the eye and says, the thing is that you do not understand. The only way I can teach my discipline, you fill in the blanks, is through and he slowed right down a lecture right now the bad news for him were that was that the new campus that Rob talked about at the start has no lecture theaters uh, and uh, it hasn't got staff offices either and uh, that 
was going to be, as it turned out, subsequently turned out to be, a big problem for him and some others, a handful of others, not many. Uh, but uh, what I would say is that uh, you cannot stop someone lecturing at six people if, you have to, if, you, if six people is your audience in a small room. Uh, they, if they want to do that, they can still do that. We do not take peer observation as performance management. We do a lot of peer observation for enhancement, and that is a key tool. Uh, that we use for mutual enhancement, for mutual benefit. And there is a protocol to follow, which is confidential to the, uh, to the people involved. It is mutual. I would also say that, um, <clears throat> that uh, the all good blends contain elements of multiple, from mul multiple sources. We're not saying teacher-centeredness is completely off the table. You, it's banned. Absolutely not. Every good blend has elements of different kinds. Teacher-centeredness, in moderation, is one of those. And I will, I will end uh, by saying uh, that uh, we would never go out to say, um, oh, ABL works or ABL doesn't work. I mean, we could say all sorts of things about ABL, PBL, TBL, UDL, and whatever else you want. What matters is not the, the name or the method. What matters is, is how you apply that method in context. Content is not king, context is. Uh, and that is what matters here. Yes. Um, Back to you, I, uh, Yeah, uh, I think at this point, thank you. There's, I don't know, John Cooperthwaite, do you want to ask your question? Because it is li little bit related to disciplinariness. Oh yeah, happy to. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, so it's really just from experience that uh, there can be some courses where there's many, many different uh, people involved, some clinical, some kind of uh, teaching from the university. And it's just how we might sort of find that way of of linking people together through a module to, to get a more interactive kind of uh, sense of, of how teaching is going to be developed. It's, it's just a, it's something I've come across many times and I um, I'd love to know if you've kind of found some kind of ways forward of doing that at Northampton or elsewhere. I think that's a, that's a, a good cue to describe the Cairo process in more detail. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I, I will give it a go and then Rob can, can, can top it up. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, if you like, putting your course module or program uh, through a Cairo process is uh, a requirement for validation and for other academic quality processes uh, at Northampton and um, and those processes have to be facilitated by trained people who uh, bring a true interdisciplinary uh, flavor to those to those design workshops that means bringing in learning technologists learning designers it means bringing in students and where appropriate it means bringing in employers to that and it is not it is not a one hour thing it can take a lot longer like half day slots or even two days in a row <clears throat> that is the critical tool that enabled us to scale up that enabled us to bring to bring the team together as opposed to oh you you do module 1 i do module 2 she does module 3 uh, which, uh, which 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 is a recipe for complete lack of consistency. We are not advocating uh, a strict standard or a strict template. What we are, we are advocating freedom and creativity and all the rest of it within a, a set of consistent principles that the students can identify. Uh, so over to Rob, if you want to add anything else. Uh, I was just going to say, I've just, I know we're quite short of time, so I've just popped something into the chat window about what is Cairo. It's, a, um, it's an oldish blog posting. We're doing a, a review at the moment. So if you're interested in any more in that, please do get in touch um, and we'll give you some more details. Yes, yeah, thank you both. I mean, just the last question perhaps to Virginia, because I know as Elastic, we are very much interested in methodologies and when we're running projects and evaluation and research of student experiences around technology. Is, is there anything, if people wanted to, you know, do a similar evaluation, perhaps, is there anything that you might suggest for, for us? Well, engage tutors first and foremost and get their time because learner uh, students will not uh, give you their 
time. They will be okay if they if you can have the last 20 minutes of a session, uh, but it's going to be very difficult to get them to actually move and go to your office or something like that. And I'm so sorry, I know we are very short on time, but there's something that is happening, it has been going on on the chat that I think is yeah. really, really important. Uh, several people ask for recommendations and Jeffrey was, uh, mentioned something about uh, learner, uh, students, sorry, uh, students being uh, conservative. And I think that's a really important point too. Um, we, one of the things we realized in the tutor stage was that it was incredibly important to also teach students about what ABL is. If you're going to make them learn in a slightly different, innovative, transformative way, then they need to know what, they, what they're expecting uh, to overcome those expectation gaps and all of that conservative. So uh, that would probably be one of the, my main recommendations in, in any case is to um, teach tutors what they're going to be doing and the value of it and also learners, uh, students, because it's incredibly important that uh, to get them engaged. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And thank you, all, all the three of you. Thank you, everyone in the chat as well, because there, there's just some brilliant conversations around that. Um, and hope, you know, once we've um, finished this session, we will make this available uh, on our website and in our blog. Just to uh, reiterate, and for those of you who might be new to LSIG of who we are, we are a um, community of researchers and practitioners and we come together to you know to disseminate share practice and it's it's we're all very much interested in researching and evaluating learners experiences with technology so if you do want to get involved then um, there is a few ways that we've listed here so you can join us uh, we've got a disk mail and the old site as well and there's some really in good instructions you know, if you wanted to attend uh, our next webinar or propose a webinar yourself or a topic, then do get in touch with us. Uh, you can look out for our LS6 Scholar Scheme Pilot, which is a mentoring scheme that we're doing around research and evaluation. Follow us on Twitter, or if you want to write a blog post, let's say about this webinar and some of those thoughts that you've been contributing to the chat, that would be brilliant. And uh, also we have got regional conveners. So for instance, I'm the co-lead for Northwest. Rob is in, in the Midlands. So, you know, you can uh, find us and get in touch and um, get involved. Don't, don't just, can, I, can, I, can I just add that there's, I can, I've just been scrolling up and down the chat. There's a lot yeah. of stuff in there that we did not yeah. touch on. And I'm sorry, colleagues, that we haven't had the time to do that. But I hope that through those other sessions, other regional meetings or discussions we can address those things i have not forgotten them yeah i mean i don't know if what we could do is that we, we could start a blog of this session because I, I also think there were some really really good questions and i wondered if we pasted them out in the blog and if you had time i don't know to perhaps just pen some responses to that would that be a a good way to do but I know there were some really good comments and conversations around that but just to plug um, so thank you Ali and and colleagues for for this excellent session it was a brilliant opening very apt and I know in Northampton you were already seven years ahead of time I guess <laughs> from looking back from this year so our next session is on the 27th of March and the details are there and um, you can sign up on our webinars list but um, I think th this is us, four of us saying goodbye. Is there anything else, Rob, colleagues, you want to add? But thank you so much for your time and see you next time. No, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you all. See you next time.